For news and opinion that you won't find on Fox or MSNBC, check out America's Survival TV on Roku, in the channel store under News and Weather, or on the Roku website, use access code USA123, or on YouTube at the USA Survival Channel, America's Survival TV on Roku. Radio for Readers Bookmark This is Bookmark. I'm Mark Furnier. The nation's top authors are coming up next. Bookmark. Most obvious question for our guest Nick Desbanes is, who is the author of the book on paper, is did you write about the fact that you were using paper to write your book? (laughs) Thanks for being with us today. (laughs) Well, absolutely. We can't live without paper and uh, I, as a writer, have always had a great and abiding respect for it. I don't think that's that was the motivation to do it. The motivation really was my earlier, the, all of the work I had done in my eight earlier books, which had been on one aspect or another of book, book culture, you know, bibliomania and gentle madness or a selective history of libraries and the future of libraries and patience and fortitude and a book about reading every book its reader. It just seemed logical that the next step should take in the stuff of transmission itself for over many hundreds of years. And that led to a much wider examination of the material itself. So much to ask you. Let me go take ahead. it from the beginning. Paper, you go back to the Chinese. Exactly. And they invented it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, how long did it take before other cultures picked it up? How did it move That's from the That's a Chinese? great question. And that's really one of the compelling uh, aspects of the story for me was not only its invention in China, the Chinese even give you a date. They'll say 105 AD, it was Tsai Lung. He was uh, working for the imperial court and he did, there was such a man in that year, did present an articulation of paper making. But it really did uh, develop over several hundred years prior to that, but it's about a, a neat 200 year gestation. But they basically kept it as a proprietary craft for about 500 years or so. And then it started, and, and they used it for everything, not just writing. They used it for clothing. Marco Polo comes comes back to Europe uh, a couple hundred years later. He marvels that the great Khan is using it for currency. You know, they used, uh, they used it for offerings in uh, Buddhist and Shinto uh, uh, re- religious exercise. So they used it for everything. And they really, and it, it, was, it was ubiquitous. But it took 500 years, basically, to get 300 years to get to Korea by way of Buddhist monks, then from there into J- Japan, and then on the, other, on the other side, moving along the Silk Road, one country after another. So that migration became really, really very, very uh, c- compelling for me to study. And the fact that so much of it is documentable and that there are great stories surrounding it. Because to me, storytelling is the thing. You've got to have those stories. Before paper, how did people either record keep or preserve history? You know, uh, in one of my other books, A Splendor of Letters, I had a chapter that was another one of the inspirations for this, a chapter on the various writing surfaces that we have employed as a species through history. Writing goes back 5,000 years. I mean, we have examples from 3000 BC in Mesopotamia, the the, uh, Sumerians there recorded their writings on uh, clay tablets, which they baked and which still still survived uh, by the thousands. Most of them are for record keeping. The ones that you look at, most of them are for, you know, grain transactions or cattle transactions. We also get the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is a thousand years older than Homer's Iliad you know, by way of baked clay tablets. But the gold standard for 3,000 years, you know, paper has been around for 2,000 years, but the era of papyrus, which is not paper. That's what I learned when I was going to school. Here, but, you know, and I'll happily explain it. Is it rice? No, papyrus is a marsh reed, and it's, it, grow, it grew in abundance along the, the Nile River, and pa- but it's also the process. Yes, like paper, they share the same root for the same name in the West, called different things elsewhere, but papyrus is made from one plant, and it's not a compound. That's the big thing. What the Chinese discovered, this is what really also attracted me, is the idea of paper. There's nothing at all inevitable about it. It took some great perception for people in China to realize that if you took a vegetative source, any vegetative source, as long as it's cellulose, because there are, there are these, I think they're unique. You hate to use that word unique because somebody else will find uh, another thing. But 
basically unique properties of cellulose that allow, because of these hydroxyl bonds, hydrogen atoms and oxygen atoms uh, contained in one unit, and if you reduce any vegetative source to a fiber, pound it into a pulp, suspend it in great copious volumes of water, and then uh, uh, pass it through a screen sieve, the water passes out, the fibers remain in the mat, and when it dries, there you have a piece of paper. That was the process then, and it continues to this day to be the process now. That hasn't changed. But once you understood these rudiments, it was, very, it was not hard to master. But they kept that, they had that secret for many hundreds of years, and then the Buddhist monks really started bringing it because it was essential, also very useful in the propagation of their religion. Nick, Bays, uh, Nick Basbanes is our guest. On paper is the book. Is there controversy, Nick, as paper develops? where cultures or countries worry about the destruction of, of property to make paper. In other words, trees. When we start publishing more books as society evolves, yeah, that's a good we, we hear about it much later, but is there a fear that we're destroying uh, trees to make books? Well, that's, the, the use of trees, and I really devote a good deal of attention to that in the, the rags to riches chapter, was because rags were really the fundamental fiber uh, in Europe and also in the Middle East. The Chinese really didn't use rags. They used direct fiber. And by the way, the Chinese and the Japanese don't harvest the trees. They, if they use the paper mulberry tree or whatever, they take the, the branches the, of young saplings, and what they take is the inner bark. It's called bast, a good one-word, uh, one-syllable word, and but it's that fibrous material, white fibrous material that they remove from the inner bark. But those trees are not harvested. The use of trees for for paper making really developed in the 19th century. It's not old at all, and uh, and there were a lot of complications involved, chemical complications. Uh, yes, there is cellulosic fiber in trees, but there's also a compound known as lignin. The reason paper got so bad starting in the 19th century is because so much of it was made from trees, and this lignin, which was responsible for yellowing and brittleness, they took a lot of chemical processes to figure out how to remove that. And that's really one of the reasons that a lot of paper mills are, are pollutants. You know, uh, here in Florida, there's a situation over the Fen Holloway River, you know, out in the Pen Panhandle. That's classified as a dead river, I think, and largely because of the Buckeye plant, which, I mean, this has been well written about and documented. I'm not saying anything that isn't known and hasn't been written about, and I don't have that in the book, in fact, but that's just a situation uh, Nick, that's when developed. Did, when did they move over to pulp wood for newspapers? Well, in the middle of the, uh, towards the end of the 19th century, as, as the process became more refined, and as they were actually able to, to figure out ways of, of dealing with the lignin and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a 19th century thing entirely. And the best paper then, and continues to be today, rag paper. You know, because cellulose, uh, cotton is the purest form of cellulose. The Crane Paper Company, which I write about, they make all of the paper for American currency. They've been in business since 1801. They have never used a tree in their whole history. They're 100% tree free. They use 75% cotton, 25% flax. And, and uh, you know, you say 100% rag paper. Look at, look at the stationery they make or others make. When you have rag paper, it still is the standard. Uh, Nick, one of my listeners told me that hemp was used for a while. The, China, uh, the original ingredients in China, Kai Lun had uh, frayed uh, hemp from cordage, from ropes, you know, because hemp is used for cords, uh, for rope, uh, old, old fishnets, cotton. And uh, so actually, I, I maintain the paper is the very first uh, uh, demonstrably uh, recyclable industry where, 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 where other materials were recycled. You know, most, a lot of your newsprint today, by the way, is made from recycled paper, and I have a lot on that in the book, too. Is a part of it because it could, ink could adhere to it okay? Is that why they went to pulp wood? No, because it was abundant. It was it, abundant. It was inexhaustible. Okay. It, it really, it's because of the inexhaustibility of that, that so many other things become possible. You know, we have, go into, uh, you know, hyg the hygienic uh, area. You know, I quote one fellow who was asked back in the 80s as the computers were coming on, Jesse Scherer. He was asked about the paperless library or the paperless society, one or the other. And he said the paperless society is about as probable as the paperless bathroom. You know, Do you the, feel that way? Uh, that yes, yes, I do. In fact, I, I, I've, I'm, I'm writing a, an op-ed piece for a major publication. And the, the premise is the myth of the paperless society. 
because, okay, yes, books are in decline with respect to using paper. Newspapers, we all know what's happening to them. Record keeping in the government, stock transactions, and I think that that's fabulous that that's happening, you know. I'm sorry I just drew like this, uh, but that's a good thing. But I also say, and I cite figures, which indicate there are 20,000 identifiable commercial uses in the world today for paper, and they aren't going away anytime soon. And I give you a lot of uh, examples of where that's the case. Well, I also wonder, too, this book comes at a time in which that debate is there. That was part of the, idea, the motivation, sure. Universities are telling staffs, we're trying to go paperless. Uh, banks, insurance companies, they all want you to do this stuff online, paperless situations. It's easier for them. It's not expensive to mail out bills. Um, and there's postage issues. There's a whole bunch of things that go Can there. I make a comment on Please, that. that's what. All right, so I'm asked this question. What, what, about the pres what about preservation? What about the long-term uh, integrity of things that are born digital? You know, this is the first time in the 5,000 year history of writing and reading where you need a mechanical interface to read something. You need a software. Do you have any confidence at all that a, that a material that is born digital today will be available, will be accessible 100 years from now? I have held no a assurance. I have held a Gutenberg Bible in my hands, printed in the 1450s, the one at Princeton University. And that paper looks as gorgeous today as it was when it was produced half a millennium ago. And the only, the only qualification I need to be able to read that is an ability to read Latin. You know, I don't need a software that might be uh, obsolete 10 years from now or a 12-inch disk. Who has machines that read 12-inch disks or 5-inch disks or magnetic, ta magnetic tapes that have degraded? I talked to the National Archivist in this book because they are the custodians of 80 billion pieces of paper. Uh, and they, and they, of course, so much of government uh, uh, bureaucracy is now being uh, documented on in a digital fashion. I said, "What's the most reliable form uh, of, uh, of uh, documentation?" As an archivist, he said, "For very important documents, we still make a paper copy. You know, paper is safer and paper is more reliable." So I'll go along with the National Archivist. You present a very strong argument and facts that surround the reliability, dependability of being able to read something in the future with something that may expire or become out of date or we don't have the mechanism to read it? Really? I have, I have uh, listen, I've written all my books on computers. I have five and a half inch disks. Thank goodness I still have a computer that can, if I want to go back and read some of these early drafts where I can access that material. Uh, it's so much easier to have paper documents, I guess, but. I'm not. I'm not a luddite. Please, I write on yeah. computers. I use the, <clears throat> pardon me. I use the internet. I do a lot of uh, uh, online research. But you know, why can't one coexist with the other? The era of papyrus coexisted for a thousand years with paper before papyrus was gone. Parchment was in the mix at the same time. You know, I, I have a profile of Robert Darton at Harvard University, custodian of more than 17 million books, largest library, academic library in the world. And he said, you know, we can have both. And he's also one of the great proponents of digital libraries. You know, you use the best of one and you use the best of, other, uh, of the other. And his most recent book was called The Case for Books. And books as we know them is, was, the, was the suggestion. Nick, before you go, <clears throat> what's the reaction of the publishers and other people that make their living still with paper? Are they applauding your writing, or are they concerned? I hope so. I don't hear from them directly, but uh, I have had a lot of wonderful, positive uh, feedback from the book uh, with reviews and, and, and the enthusiasm I sense when I speak, and I've given a lot of really very satisfying uh, talks so far to such places at the Library of Congress and the Boston Athenaeum and the American Philosophical Society. That's and, and, what, they, and they've been very supportive. I'm glad you brought that up because I didn't want this interview to end before I asked you the future of libraries. We had a discussion on our radio program about this with so many people going to the internet to do their research and so much going on with computers. Libraries have never been busier. They've never, why is that? Well, because Is it a certain demographic? Well, I think libraries are, are more than just repositories for books. You go there to f learn things, and, and they, they, they're savvy. You know, I mean, they have electronic uh, uh, things there for you to access. I just think a, a, a library is also the people's library. Uh, you know, it's the people's university. I, in one of my books, I told how so many great scholars did all of their work in public libraries. I, I think it's, it's a lot, uh, it's a very complicated uh, question to answer, but, uh, and it goes beyond just uh, being a repository for, for 
uh, paper, books and works on paper. So, but I believe the library has a great future. I was just going to say, good news for our listeners and viewers is that libraries, according to Nick Basbane, is not going away soon. That's it, in a nutshell. <laughs> on paper. Nick Basbane is our guest today on the Bookmark Program at Miami Book Fair. Nick, great seeing you, Mark, sir. Thanks thank so you. much. Thank you, sir. That's Bookmark for this week. If you have comments or thoughts on future authors, send an email to us at our website, bookmark.us. That's our broadcast for today. Thanks for watching.